Hi, um, while I was doing the video on the iPod Nano Display Reverse Engineering, um, I shot a few sections about um, some advanced scopes features, and because that video was so long, I decided to pull those out into a separate video. So um, some of these bits might look a little bit disjointed, but hopefully most of the content is there and there'll be some useful stuff in there. We're just going to talk about um, memory and understanding the memory, up, um, how your scope uses the memory, which is quite important. Um, what we've got here, we've got a zoom display purely, it just makes it easier to, to show what's going on. So we're, we're basically capturing this amount of data and then we're zooming on the, in on this tiny little section of it, um, just so we can see you know, the, the, the fine detail within that section. So I've set this up so that this is using, yeah, pretty much maxing out the amount of memory it's using. But So we've still just about got, got, got this waveform. Um, we've got enough memory to store this at, at this resolution. But watch what happens if I just turn another channel on. What's happened there? Well, most four-channel scope, they tend to share A to D converters. Now, most four-channel scopes are derived, tend to have a two-channel variant. The architecture normally is that the two-channel version has one A to D that's shared between those two channels, and then the, uh, the second two channels have, that, have another A to D. One thing this means though is that if you're only using two channels it actually matters which two channels you're using. This is just using channels um, 1 and 3 where we've got the full resolution. Um, if I just turn, turn it, change it so that we're using, swap the inputs so we're only using channels 1 and 2. I haven't changed any of the time base settings. So on exactly the same um, we're now getting much less resolution because what we're doing, when we're using a four channel scope in two channel mode, we're basically only got one A to Z, the other one is just sitting there doing nothing. And yeah, th this is the sort of thing that generally is explained in the manual if you actually bother to read the manual, but you know, it can be sometimes a bit hard to, to, to find. So let's go back to our original setup. We've now got the detail back again, purely because we're using the right channels, but if I turn on either channel two or channel four, we lose that data again. Obviously things like if I turn on digital channels, that's using more memory, so we lose the, the information there as well. Um, so the acquisition mode, most scopes have a few different acquisition modes. This is in peak detect mode. Now what the peak detect mode does, it basically runs the A to D as fast as it can, and each sample it stores is, it actually stores the, the minimum and the maximum it saw within that acquisition period. Um, so that when you're on slower time-based settings, you can actually see small glitches, because it's actually been acquiring throughout the... Um, the short pulse and say so if you've got some very very short pulses peak detect mode will generally show them whereas the normal mode will quite often miss them the consequence of that is that peak detect mode uses more memory so if we just turn another channel on so we're now back into our we can't see anything mode but if i then change the acquisition mode to normal we've now got our data back again because we're now the normal mode uses less memory per sample um, so we've actually now got the information back the other difference is whether it, when you're running uh, single shot or continuous. Now, if I just hit stop, we get our frozen sort of fairly grotty waveform because we've, we're running out of memory. But when you're in run mode, it's actually double buffering it, which means that it's acquiring one set of waveforms whilst it's displaying the other one. Um, so each screen refresh, it actually swaps memory. So what, what that effectively means is you're only getting half the memory. So the way around that is to simply, if you do a single trigger, see we now get nice clean data, whereas if we do run and then stop, because it's doing this double buffering, it's only using half the available memory. So when you're, you know, when you're doing things like this, where you want to maximise the amount of memory, you, you know, it's really good to have an understanding of how your scope uses the memory, because that can make quite a big difference to how much information you can get out of it. And one thing which I, I find annoying again, it, it would be nice if you had, actually had a mode where it would just do repetitive single, because that would give you a, a sort of continuous display like that, without this memory loss. But. Uh... Oh, that's just a minor annoyance, but yeah, it's always worth that. You know, if you're struggling to actually resolve detail when you're analysing complex waveforms, it's it's always worth just trying to understand how the scope actually handles its memory because you know you can suddenly find that you've only got you know, literally if you just happen to have peak detect on, you're in run mode and you're using um, the wrong two channels. You know, you've effectively divided your memory from eight megs to one meg purely by doing that. So um, it's it's always useful to, um, to sort of think about those things when you when you're doing things that really need the uh, memory. The other thing I want to look at is segmented memory. Now that, that's, this is something which you don't often see explained very well. What segmented memory does, normally what happens when the scope triggers, it just fills its memory once and then you know, it either does it repetitive like this or you do a single trace and it stops and you get a single trace. Now that's fine in a lot of cases, but where you've got situations like this, you've got a lot of fine detail with quite big gaps in it, so that if you want to look in detail about what's going on in each of these pulses, you're actually wasting a lot of your available memory 
in these in these gaps so you'd have to for example actually set up a trigger on each of these pulses separately to be able to expand it far enough to really analyze it in detail um, particularly if you've not if you've not got, got a huge amount of memory um, in the, this example we can just about do it but we can actually get a bit more detail by using segmented memory so what I can tell it to do if I go into segmented mode um, you tell it how many segments. Again, the, the, the actual interface on different scopes is probably going to be slightly different. Some, some scopes might actually give you the segment length rather than number of segments. The other time this can be useful is if you want to, for example, in a video situation, capture the same data from a number of different frames. Again, you know, you've got your 60 millisecond frame thing, but if you want to get a tiny little bit of information from each of these frames, obviously you're going to run out of memory fairly quickly. So an example of how segmented memory would help is if you want to capture this first sequence on say 10 frames we set up, um, it's actually set to 11 segments, we put segmented mode on and when it gets a trigger it basically triggers that number of times, so in this case it's 11 and what we can then do, we can actually then scroll through those acquisitions now this is probably a bad example because the actual data in these is actually quite similar if we just do that again with a slightly uh, longer time base um, we can probably get a bit more useful information out of this. Yeah, okay, so what we're doing now, we can actually adjust it, and this is actually telling us which segment it is. It also tells us the um, the time it was captured as well. So we can actually zoom in and look at those different captures in fine detail, despite the fact that they're captured over quite a long period of time, so I'll just change the time base setting. So we've now got quite a lot of detail, like yeah, a few nanoseconds worth of detail on events that happened over a period of about 100 milliseconds. So it basically lets you get lots and lots of little snapshots um, which again for analysing complex data is can be really handy and the other time segmented memory can be really handy is if you're doing things like analysing streams of serial data you know, you've got various sort of packets of serial data um, you can just get it to trigger on each packet and without wasting any of the uh, the memory between the packets so that, that's another really handy thing if you've, got, if you've got serial decode option on the scope as well um, you can capture a lot of detail out of a lot of packets without wasting memory from all the gaps in between them the other really handy feature on um, more advanced scopes is the intensity display. Um, I've just gone back to a really simple edge trigger on here. And I've turned, all, I've turned the hold off down as well. So we're just triggering on the edge and we've got this sort of fairly complex waveform with all the things that happen happening o overlap. So this is what you'd see on a, um, a fairly low end scope. It's just basically an, a, a, an overlap of pretty much everything that's going on. But what you can do, um, on a scope that's got a high update rate and intensity display, if we turn the intensity down, we actually start to see a lot more information. What this is, what what the intensity display does is it effectively it captures lots and lots of triggers within that screen time and plots an intensity based on how frequently those things happen. So what this tells us, if we go from from this display down to here, we can now see that these events are happening much less frequently because they're dimmer. They're a much less frequent event. So that sort of yeah, that that's the sort of information you get from an analog scope, but obviously you don't have the the, you know, the capability or the screen phrasing. So um, that that's the sort of capability that makes a really really big difference when you're trying to make sense of a complex signal, um, particularly things like video signals. But it also tells you, for example, so you get some information just about the density of pulses on the waveform. And if we, for example, as we scroll this display, you can actually see this information scrolling across. So, for example, we, we, yeah, we can now tell that the horizontal direction here corresponds to the vertical axis on this, um, on this display. Whereas if we can't see that information, we, you know, we just can't see that at all. We get no information whatsoever. But as soon as we have that intensity display, we actually start seeing some quite useful information. And that, that can also be handy when you're looking at sort of communications protocols. You can get an idea, of, for example, whether the data in a series, like say an RS-232 packet, is constant or changing, because the intensity will just give you a sort of signature of the data within that packet. And if we actually go to our test photos, this is where it starts getting quite interesting. So, for example, here we see all white scrolling to all black. And we, we can see a very clear transition. So, I mean, this tells us quite a few things about the nature of the data we're looking at, even without without having any, any sort of particularly complex trigger set up. You know, it tells us that, well, you know, on this trace, this is, this is a, uh, a differential signal, so we normally expect the two to be an inverse. So if we, um, it tells us that this is basically the positive signal, because when it's white, we've got a high, and when it's black, we've got a low. So that tells us that the information is probably a fairly simple binary coding. 
and it's not scrambled or encrypted or anything stupid like that. Um, here's another example um, with serial data. This is actually um, uh, DMX data, uh, which is uh, async data at 250k bits. But the same applies to pretty much async, uh, pretty much any um, situation where you've got uh, you know, quite a lot of serial data and you want to just get some feel for what's going on. Again, with intensity full up, which is what you see on um, uh, a lower end scope, you uh, just see this sort of solid block of data. But if you turn the intensity down, you can actually see quite a lot of patterns in there, so you can see this is actually just a moving, some sort of moving graphics uh, at a fairly high frame rate. But although you can't say a great deal about what the actual data is, you know, you can get some sort of feel for, yeah, you know, is it changing, isn't it changing, or what sort of speed is it changing, isn't there any, any sort of obvious uh, progression in it? So that, that can actually be quite handy when um, looking at uh, sort of, uh, fairly large amounts of serial data just to get a very general overview before obviously you can then sort of zo you know, zoom in and. Um, so sort of see the fine data, but yeah, it's it's quite handy just to get like an overview of a fair, fairly large amount of data in a, a very quick and easy um, display.